The following show is brought to you in part by support from Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi. We don't just practice law, we make history. Online at rkmc.com. I think we have a very interesting show for you tonight. Charles Biederman died in 2004 after living more than 60 years in Red Wing, Minnesota. His death, though, was noted in the New York Times. There was a big article about him when he died because in the world of art, he was considered by many as a very, very important modernist. My guest tonight is a man named Glenn Gordon. Glenn is a photographer, a writer, a sculptor, a designer, a furniture maker, and a man who befriended Biederman in his last years and would go to Red Wing frequently to see him, to photograph him, to help catalog his works. And so we're going to talk tonight with Glenn about Charles Biederman, looking at Biederman through the lens of Glenn Gordon and really learning about his personal impressions of the man, a man who is considered very eccentric by many, and also learning about how he is viewed in the, the world of art. So it's going to be a, a fun, fun show, and I'm so glad you could come down and, and talk with me. I've become very um, intrigued by this man, by his work, by your connection. Tell the audience how you first um, made this uh, connection and, and were introduced to him. Well, it was a series of um, unplanned circumstances. I first ran across his work when I was wandering through the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art one day and turned a corner and ran into one of his late uh, works, a relief sculpture, uh, and it floored me. It was just one of these pieces of work that just uh, demolishes your defenses. And uh, the sensation uh, that I had was um, uh, suddenly my breathing changed. Mm -hmm. uh, light started to flood, flood me. And it was just an extraordinary encounter, uh, completely unexpected with a work of art. And uh, it also, uh, there were qualities in the work that were very similar to the work of my father, who was also a sculptor. Uh, and I didn't think much of it for several years. I used to visit the piece in the museum. Uh, but then several years later, I started working for uh, the Weissman Art Museum as an art handler. By then, uh, Charles Biederman had reached uh, an understanding with the Weisman that he was going to bequeath his whole uh, oeuvre to him, to them after he died. And that required the Weisman to send a crew down to his farmhouse in Red Wing and uh, slowly uh, retrieve the work, catalog it, make note of uh, when it was made to an entire uh, art inventory of the work. So I was a member of these crews that would go down uh, once every month or six weeks. Uh, and while I was going down there, I, I started bringing a camera because uh, Biederman was incredibly intriguing. He was very eccentric. He was... Uh, Not only physically, but his personality. His, yeah, he was, also he was correct. ferociously opinionated, uh, loved to hold forth. Uh, if he had a captive audience, and I was willing to be a captive mm -hmm. audience. So I started just paying close attention to him with a, a lens and a notebook. I've actually written a little bit of, about him. After I left the Weissman, 
I continued going down there with a fellow by the name of Neil Larson, who was a very devoted uh, follower of Biedermann's uh, art and Biedermann's theories about art, and become such a close friend of Biedermann's that he took care of all of his his business, his correspondence, his relations with uh, museums and galleries. He was almost um, using the word disciple. Or an um, acolyte. In some yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I started going down to Red Wing twice a month with Neil and continued to photograph uh, Biederman while Neil and he conversed because uh, Biederman didn't have to relate to me. It was a lot easier to photograph Biederman. He was in, engaged with, uh, with Neil. And I did this off and on for uh, four or five years until Biederman died in 2004. If you would define modernism for those who are not at all familiar with the term, how would you define it? Because Biederman has been called probably more often than anything else a modernist. It's a big word, and it's um, bandied about in all kinds of ways by people who like to sound like they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but the modern movement, uh, some people say it started with the Impressionists, with Monet and Manet, uh, the first responses to the Industrial Revolution. But then modernism as a full-fledged movement really took off after uh, the First World War with the foundation of the Bauhaus in Germany, which developed an architecture very uh, much devoted to the clarity and simplicity of right angles, uh, abstraction, no um, embellishment, no ornamentation, things like that. It was the beginning of uh, the legitimization of abstraction. And it was expressed in architecture the modern as we know it. Biederman clearly was uh, sensitized to it. He uh, went to Paris as modernism was taking off in Paris and there met people who were very, uh, who were operating in a similar language like Vasily uh, Kandinsky, uh, Ferdinand Leger, uh, Miro, he also met Picasso, for whom he had very little use. It was very funny about Picasso. The, the book we just held up is an example of some of his later work, isn't it? Yes, um. yes. He, uh, he wore every hat that came down the pike for a while. He, he experimented with surrealism, uh, what people call biomorphism, where you have these blob-like forms uh, that are supposedly generated organically or from nature, and then slowly found his way into a more geometric kind of work. A lot of people might think of Biederman more as a sculptor than a painter, but can you just briefly describe the process that he went through to come up with his reliefs as we just saw a relief. Uh, well, it's hard to speak for him since he's in the grave, but mm -hmm. uh, he, he began uh, as a student at the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, took a lot of uh, Beaux-Arts, conventional classic painting and uh, drawing studies, and he was a superb uh, draftsman. His figure drawing was quite beautiful. He was a, as, you know, as good as some of the best our artist's renaissance, I felt his drawings were phenomenal. But he quickly got tired of what he would call mimesis or representation. And there was something in the air, uh, uh, the development of abstraction as a way of understanding the world visually. And he got caught up with it and uh, still began, still do, working as a painter. And then something in him wanted to project off the wall. He never really became totally involved in sculpture in the round, but there were things that he felt pushing out from the picture plane that could not be contained on a flat canvas. 
And that and led I want him. to interrupt you for just a minute and show people an example of his earlier work. One of his yeah. early works that has a three-dimensional quality to it, doesn't it? Very similar to the work of uh, Miro. Uh, yes, very uh, similar. People have sometimes mistaken this period of Biedermann's work for Miro. Here is, uh, if you can see this side, this is a Mondrian to show uh, the direction that he eventually went, except that, uh, I don't know if I'm being fair to Mondrian and Biedermann both, but what he essentially did with, with Mondrian is push these elements out. He felt some colors pushed out of the picture plane, some of them receded. So he started developing these relationships in uh, shallow space. His, his sense of color was so primary, wasn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. he really used the primary colors. Um, let's backtrack just a little and just give us um, a map of how he moved from Cleveland, where he was born, to Chicago, where he went, as you mentioned, to the mm -hmm. Art Institute School. From there to New York, correct? Mm -hmm. And then to Paris. Mm -hmm. And then back to Red Wing. To or Red, not back to Red Wing, but to Red Wing. To Chicago and then uh, Red Wing. Ah, I, think, right. I think that's the way it went. Well, he was born in Cleveland of uh, Czech immigrant parents. He didn't speak any English until uh, he was well along in grammar school, from what I understand. Uh, and I think he got a scholarship to the Art Institute of Chicago. He went there, but uh, uh, beginning to set a lifelong pattern, he managed to uh, develop antagonisms with his teachers there. He felt he knew uh, more than they did. They Which was what happened with many of with his, his relationships. His later relationships. Right. He was just, uh, he was a contrarian. Mm -hmm. So he... Uh, but he studied there and uh, uh, was very poor. At one point, he had to sleep uh, on park benches in Chicago in order to continue to paint. Then something happened that uh, propelled him to Chicago. I can't remember the detail. To, to, to uh, New York. To New York. Mm -hmm. And there he fell in with this growing uh, interest in modernism and uh, I started meeting other painters, and I believe he had two shows in New York. He got restless in New York, went to Paris in the mid-30s, 35, I think, something like that. And there, in a very short period, I think he was there for eight or nine months, maybe a year, uh, met a lot of the figures who later became the As history you said, of the... Picasso. Right, right. Miro. And... Um, in a very short time, he found a way to be uh, critical of all of them to such an extent that he didn't even want to be in Paris anymore. So he came back to New York uh, where he met uh, uh, a woman named Eugenie Anderson who was married to a gentleman named John Anderson uh, who was the heir to the uh, fortune uh, made by the guy who invented Quaker puff rice, the the method for making Quaker. John was the son the of son, that. The son of the the of the, the, of mm -hmm. the inventor, the founder of that. Uh, and uh, John Anderson himself was quite a good artist, very interested in art. He and uh, Biederman became friends, and Biederman uh, slowly got involved with Anderson's wife's sister. Anderson's wife's name was Eugenie Anderson. And we yeah. know Eugenie in Minnesota because of her wonderful work with um, her ambassador positions. Yes, yes. Um, her work with the Democratic Party. Party, yeah. Um, she was the first female ambassador uh, in our country, really went to Denmark and then Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. and, um, so quite an interesting connection. And, her sister then was Mary, Mary who married and Charles. She married Charles' second marriage for Mary. The first one was uh, crushed her with boredom, apparently. <laughs> and Charles was nothing if not charismatic and uh, very adventuresome, uh, very audacious. Not conventional not like her first slightest. husband. <laughs> and so, and so, um, so they got married and. Uh, uh, 
uh, it, they moved to Red Wing, which was the center of the Anderson clan and fortune, uh, and moved there in the year that I was born, 1942, which used to confound me. I used to visit mm -hmm. him in Red Wing and, and think, this guy's been here since the day I was born. <laughs> And anyway. it's such an unlikely mm. place for a man who was um, rubbing shoulders with the, the top in the art world. Mm -hmm. Do you think he retreated to Red Wing because he didn't like the competition in New York and Chicago and Paris, because he truly loved the rural um, part of life? What was your sense? I don't think he had a particularly fond sentiment for the bucolic life. He was a very uh, cosmopolitan, urban guy. He was, he'd never gone to, uh, gotten a university education, but he was very well read in European philosophy and uh, art theory and all of that. And uh, I'm sure that Red Wing didn't know what to make of him. They never did in all the years he was there. But I think it was uh, uh, a place to which he could retreat and uh, fire off his volleys at uh, the art world from a safe distance mm. and also have complete control of his creative surroundings. He didn't have rent to pay. And the Andersons yeah. were really patrons Sustaining, in a very yeah. big way, weren't they? Enormously and generous. And, uh, and they lived in Red Wing. They did, and they were instrumental in giving him a stable place in which to produces prodigious amount of art. He worked, I read Glenn, and would you confirm this from what you learned from him? 16 hour days. Um, was the father of one child, Mar uh, Anna, Anna, Anna Brown Anna, is her name. Um, mm -hmm. Who maybe felt she didn't have a, a dad in the traditional way. Um, but not only did he work at his art, but he was a writer. And from what I've read, his writing really preceded his artwork in his mind. He wrote and then uh, painted and, and became the relief sculptor he became. Uh, that's probably true. I, I don't know that he ever put it that way, but he, he had a strong need to uh, explain himself, first of all, to himself. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. and. The first manifestation of it is this book. Which I uh, want to hold up, folks. It's uh, called it, Art is the Evolution of Visual Knowledge, which is a mouthful, and the book is... An eyeful <laughs> uh, and a headful. It, oh, I, headful I have to confess uh, uh, to never having been able to finish the entire reading book. it. Because I think his gifts were far more in the realm of the visual than the literary. And yet this book was a huge influence. It was a huge influence in the art world. And in uh, Europe? In Europe, yes. It was considered mm -hmm. quite an important um, a seminal, piece, A seminal it? work uh, mm -hmm. of art theory. And he goes all the way back to the cave paintings, to the Egyptians, and then marches through uh, European art history uh, to make... Uh, series of points, which I have to confess I've never completely <laughs> understood because it could be very, many did, very abstruse, very abstruse. But I think the main thing that it did, aside from propagandizing for his work, his own work, is it helped him clarify to himself what he was doing and why he was doing it. He was very, um, very dialectical thinker, very interested in reasons. Uh, there was a period later in life where he got into a long correspondence with a physicist. Uh, Bohm. Bohm, mm -hmm. uh, because he was very interested in getting to the nut and the nature of things, and he was uh, very persistent. He wrote, after this book, I believe 12 more, uh, none of them quite as thick a tome, but very impassioned and continued to write, and his wife Mary continued to copy edit him through all of those books except for the last four, which I think were written after she died. We only have a few minutes left, Glenn, but do you think um, that his place in the world of art is fairly secure? 
he had big expositions at the Institute of Arts here mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. at the Wiseman, at the Hayward Gallery in London. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's going to hold up as a modernist? He was very anxious opinion? about uh, his immortality. It was very interesting to spend time with him. Part of his bequest was uh, to Neil Larson to write his authorized biography. He wanted to sort of nail himself a place down in history to uh, a really interesting degree. I think that in the, in the world of art, uh, there's an oscillation. Uh, reputations rise and fall. Uh, uh, people who were thought to be passe suddenly come back up and, and become interesting again. I think his star faded when Jackson Pollock and the Expressionists took off and then pop art, none of which he had any use for. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a renewed interest in early modernism and I think his star will rise again. I uh, personally think that he was at his best a really magnificent creator uh, once you look past his rhetoric just at the work mm -hmm. itself. Um, I think it, it's... Um, I think his reputation is in hibernation, but this book, uh, which was published just two years ago, may do something to revive it, and there may be museum uh, retrospectives uh, in the future. I'm pretty sure there will be. You have told me, but I don't think you've mentioned that the author, uh, the first author of this book that we're talking about, folks, the Charles Biederman book that we held up earlier, Neil Larson died after he died, working. Yeah. On the book for quite a while, and yeah, he was a, he was a very devoted scholar of Biederman, and as well as a friend, and uh, was overtaken by brain cancer about a year, a year and a half into the project. And before he died, he made a tremendous effort to find someone to take over the writing of the book. And the person he found was a woman named Susan Larson, who was not related to him but who happened to be a scholar of uh, 20th century modernism, art, uh, um, the modernist movement in art, an excellent choice to continue the work. And she inherited box loads of notes and correspondence and brought the book to uh, fruition. If someone wants to learn more about him, what do you think is the best way to do that, Glenn? Well, two things that I can think of if you're in, in the Twin Cities or nearby, go to the Weissman Art Museum, which has a small portion of his work on exhibit. Very it, small. I, I yeah. visited it yesterday, and there are maybe six or seven right. pieces. But I would think that if you were really avid in your interest and got in touch with the curators there, that they would be happy to show you the collection that's in storage in the in the depths of the museum. Uh, that and uh, this book, which is now available at the Weissman Bookstore, at the bookstore of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and at the Walker Art Center Bookstore. We're putting the title up right now. Um, so that is really quite widely available. It is also on Amazon. Uh, it's available on Amazon. We're also going to put up another slide that gives the name of uh, another a piece that you feel is important, and that's the exhibition catalog, again published by the Weisman, as you're mentioning. Um, and that, that's quite wonderful, too, isn't it, in showing a range of his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it reflects a lot of what's in the collection that you could see if you ever got into the basement of the Weisman. It was so very ironic and kind of sad that as he aged, he lost his vision. That must have just been he something that... He, he didn't complain. He was very stoic. He was very much a, a realist. He, he prided himself on not being a sentimentalist. And uh, uh, even though his uh, vision went the same way that Beethoven's hearing went, he... Uh, he said, well, it's just over for me. I've done my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he didn't rage against it. 
he was kind of ready to die uh, by the time. That's kind of um, uh, interesting in that he raged against so many things mm -hmm. and that he didn't rage against losing his sight, which was so crucial to him. Yeah, his, I mean, he was a little mournful about it, but he didn't complain. And in fact, he had uh, another loyal friend by the name of Max Cora, whom he supervised in the restoration of some of his later works. Um, incidentally, this fellow Max Cora has a studio at the Anderson Arts Center in Red Wing. And if anybody's interested in buying any of Biermann's mm -hmm. later books, Max Cora at the Anderson Arts Center would be the person to get in touch with. And can you also buy prints there? Um, I don't know. There were prints made. There was an edition of, of inexpensive prints made, mm. an effort to raise money, which was a chronic problem for Biederman and just about every other artist <laughs> uh, yeah. on earth. And uh, uh, whether they're still uh, on the market, I don't know. Um, I do know that uh, his auction prices are starting to go up. Mm -hmm. So if you follow auction records, uh, some of his work is coming back onto the market, which may be a sign that his Can you star give is an rising. example of a, a price, an auction Whoa, I, number? Uh, uh, it would be an idle speculation. Okay. I don't think we won't I'm, push uh, you on that. Right. Well, <laughs> you have given us some great insights about this man that um, I have just found you know, so fascinating to learn about. And your connection is so interesting. So thank you so much well, for sharing you for your impressions of him and of his art and um, his role in the world of modern art. So thank you, Glenn Gordon. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, too, for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.